Okay, we play? We play, we play. We're going to uh, explore providence and the religion of no religion together. In order to do that, we need a couple of triangles. In order to do that, we're going to explore two words. And from there, we're going to go for the implications of it. And that will give us the idea of a religion of no religion. To um, jump into one aspect of it first. By religion, I mean from the religio, which is what the word is, means something that binds together. It's a saving belief that binds people together. It's a saving belief, a belief that is thought to save someone. It's a saving belief. And that saving belief binds people together. And therefore, they can then function together under that belief. And they have camaraderie, unity, purpose. Now, there's another kind of word I want to look at. This is religion. And the other is a word I'm going to use, spirit or spirituality. Now, what I mean by spirituality, which is a curious word in our culture, is that which is achieved through some practice, some kind of practice that brings about altered states of mind. Or, of course, that's putting it negatively. Let me put it negatively first. Practice that brings about altered states of mind. Now, you can have an altered state of mind in two ways. You can, you can gain something you didn't have before, and therefore, by that addition, you've altered yourself or the mind. That's one model. The other is that there is an impediment, an impediment to our seeing. There's nothing, nothing you have to reach for. You already have it. Therefore, the other model is a purifying or a cleansing. And with that cleansing, there is an altered state of mind simply because the obscuring beliefs are no longer functioning to cloud vision. In any case, however you look at it, a person therefore can be engaged in all kinds of philosophical and yogic practices that bring on altered states of mind individually. This is a group effort. This is individual. This is therefore the development of the mind or the spirit. It's always an individual enterprise. Therefore, you can develop this realm without in any way participating into a religion, as understood in this way. So there are some people who can be religious and never touch on spirituality. There are some people who are religious who seek spirituality. Right? There are the four groups. Right? The purists, those who have belief and they think that's sufficient. Those who have a spirituality, they don't feel any need to combine with anyone else. Those are the two extremes. And between them are those two groups, which is really a mean. So that's the way we're going to use the terms this evening. Therefore, if there's going to be a religion of no religion, you can anticipate where we're going. That, that is, there may be a way in which these people can come together, but then they're not being bound by a belief, so it's not formally a religion in the sense that we just described it, but they're being bound together by a mutuality of religious, pardon me, of spiritual practices or philosophical practices or yogics. Therefore, that would be a religion of no religion. Now, 
Let's go over here with these two words, providence and fate, for a while. There are three things. Let's take the first, metaphysically, all right? There is something then that some people call God, which is a curious word. In the Greek, it's a demiurgos. The, a maker, that's what it means, a maker. A God that is a maker, a divine that is a maker. And as a consequence of reflecting on an idea in the mind of God or an idea in the mind of the demiurgos, that becomes a model. The demiurgos then can then generate or make a cosmos, a universe. Now, that means then we have a maker, something made, and some process or energy by which it was made, or by which this was conducted. So it's an energy or a means by which what was made came into existence. Now, we can talk about the relationship between these three things, which we will in a few minutes, but that's a basic triad. Now, there's another triad. Luckily for us, we happen to have another triangle. Um, there is also an activity where there can be a provider something provided, and obviously an energy or something by which that is affected. Now there's also, in this curious world of ours, most often, they are things that are connected by something that's doing the connecting, a connector. And there equally must be an energy or power that brings that about. The same thing on all three levels. Now, notice what we can do now with this schema. There's always a middle term. Now, by a middle term, we have two extremes, the maker and the maid. These are extremes. The provider, the provided, the connected, and the connector, these are extremes. The middle term, the energy by which all of this is processed, that's the mean, that's the mean term. Now, let's go back to the first model we have. And a very clear way to talk about a creation such as we're doing in this first triangle, we can also say that the maker must have first in some way made, as it were, the model. Had it, produced it, made it, and so on which then was used as the basis for the creating of the cosmos. Therefore, the maker and the maid can also stand as the maker to the primary model of creation. Now, that creation, that idea, which is the basic model upon which everything is generated or created, is the first creation. Clearly not a thing, it's a pure creation. That's sometimes called the logos, the basic plan, the basic rational principle. It's also called, therefore, the uh, first son of God, because that's the first thing created. 
Therefore, the Son of God comes from this model. Now, um, that means, you see, in that first triangle, when we put in place not the cosmos, but this first model, then we can say there's some very interesting activity which is going on. Because it's that kind of divine activity which brought about the very idea for the creation of the universe. And for all universes, and for continuous universes of all kinds and of all diversities. Clearly, if it's a model, it stands away from the things created or made. Therefore, the, the interesting feature about this model is that all of these terms, we can say in the way in which they function, are not in time. They are eternal, and therefore eternity since all of these are eternal, therefore there's a class of eternal things, which is the maker, demiurgos, the energy by which it is produced, and the model. These are all eternal. Therefore, it's a class, it fits into a class of eternity. Now, let's go down to the bottom. Things for a moment. No? Everything in the universe, in some way, can be said to be related to everything else in the universe. That is to say, you can take anything at all at random, and you can say you can relate it to, it can be described in some way as related to anything else in the universe, at least on one, on one basis. It's either the same or different. And therefore, any two things in the universe can be connected, since there must be something similar between them, even if they are just merely things, and that's the only thing they share, and everything else is different. They still can be related. They still have some commonality in respect to sameness. That is, they're things. So everything in the universe, regardless of what it is, can be said to be in some way connected either by sameness or difference. Now this is a logical, of course, connection. But let's go further. Everything in the universe, since it, can, it belongs in the class of the sameness and difference of, of anything you are regarding or considering, then no matter how far away any two things may be, we are saying in some way they are connected. They can be said to be connected. Therefore, we can say there is a network, there is a network, there is a network of the interconnection, the interrelationship, the interconnection between all things. Which is to say that all things are governed by a certain number of laws and principles, and all things therefore are influenced by them and nothing escapes these eternal laws, whether you want to regard them as the laws of physics or the philosophical principles, it doesn't make any difference. The point being that there's, this is an argument that's going to start with the, the view that whatever you regard as a thing, in respect to its physical aspects, it can be all related and connected with one another. Now that complete connection of all things, this connect, everything totally connected into all things, is sustained by a certain kind of energy. A certain kind of energy is necessary in the universe that provides all of those connections. Because through it all, uh, 
whatever a thing is to the degree that it is in time. Now, this is always in time now, right? In so far as it exists, it comes into time, passes out of time. That is to say, it comes into existence and it passes out of existence. Therefore, everything in this triangle of connection and connectors is not in eternity, it is in the aspect of time. Wow, wow, look here. Now we have an interesting thing here. Now we have all the things we can talk about in the realm of things connected. And obviously that energy that connects them, which then makes them all interrelated from a connector, is in time. Hmm. But what a thing is that comes into existence, remember we said it comes into existence, therefore, whatever you want to call its basic condition or substance is something that is generated. So in that class of things, which are all connected, it is in the class of, of, th class of things called that participates in time, and it's all generated. Now we have a third triangle. Well, there's something about, about living things, and the class of living things to the degree that they have some kind of reason, they are not subject to an ironclad deterministic model because man can decide on things. He can break out of patterns. This is all in the realm of fixed patterns. Fixed patterns that spring from our physical nature or anything's physical nature. Once you then recognize, if you have the ability to recognize the patterns you're in, once you have the ability to recognize the patterns you're in, then you can decide whether you want to enact that pattern or continue it, because then you have the freedom to decide. Well, that's reason. That's all we mean at this point by reason. Therefore, in this class of things, they're also living things. To the degree, though, that they can be said to recognize their underlining pattern, to the degree that they recognize their underlining pattern, then they are no longer fixed by that. If they are no longer fixed by it, the possibility of them breaking through patterns exists. When we say a thing is bound by the patterns of its own behavior or its pattern of its species or the conditions of its existence, whether it's a ping pong ball or an elephant, whatever it may be, we are saying that total network, that total ne network has an interesting dynamic because there's a certain kind of energy that allows it to be, right, seek its own nourishment. Animals, anything living seeks its own nourishment. It has some kind of internal integrity to it that's rather totally amazing when you think about it because it has the capability of what I call reweaving itself. Right? It reweaves broken you know, parts that are not functioning properly. To a certain degree, it has a we we reweaving cap capability. So it also, therefore, has a growth potential. So it has the ability to reweave, to nourish itself, Right? And uh, this, these living things, therefore, are quite amazing in that respect, but they're locked within the conditions of their existence, even though they have these properties. That's the word fate. That's what fate means. That's what fate means. Now, 
the degree that we have reason, what does it mean? It means that if you can see a pattern, if you can see that you're locked into a pattern, then the person has to have one more step, one more step. They have to see that they are not the pattern that they are locked into. That's not what they are. That they are bound by the pattern, but there's the possibility of recognizing the pattern comes with that recognition, the possibility that you might be able to emerge from it. So therefore, when any human being, right, any human being whose behavior is governed by fate wakes up to the possibility that they can recognize patterns emerging in their lives that lock them in. At the moment they recognize that they're patterns, then they can seek their causes, right? They can seek what maintains them. Right? They can also see the forces that bring about their dissolution. That means when they recognize the pattern that locked them into their past fated behavior, it awakens, therefore, a struggle to break out. Because in recognizing the pattern, they can then turn around. You see, they can then turn around and examine themselves. This ability to turn around and examine themselves and find that pattern and seek causes and try to decide what is it that maintains them, and especially the forces that sometimes occurs, often occurs with some people if they're lucky, that not only is there a force that maintains them, there's also a force that seems to oppose their coming out of patterns. Sometimes we call that a counterattack. Now, this ability, therefore, to turn around and decide upon it, that's your moment of freedom. That's the moment of freedom. That means we are no longer subject to the rules of fate. That's the beginning of the operation of providence. Now, we have to make sense of that word now, just as we did with the word fate. So then, we are provided with something quite remarkable. An ability, an ability to look upon ourselves. There's an energy that allows us to do it, and therefore we can see in ourselves that what we have been provided with is the ability to emerge from our fate. Now, all Greek drama all Greek drama, all Greek tragedy is nothing other than the hero has to realize he's fated and he has to discover how to break his fate. That's the nature, nature of Homer, of uh, Achilles, Odysseus, much more Penelope than Odysseus. But that moment of recognizing this and breaking out of it is to break out of fate. How is that accomplished? That's accomplished by the fact that somehow there's a part of us that can then look upon ourselves. Now, this ability to look upon ourselves is sometimes called usia, though we don't use the word too much. It's often translated as essence. Let me talk about essence for a while. As usia, I like the word usia better than essence. Anything that can turn upon itself so that it can view the whole of itself, if it can view the whole of itself in its most essential aspects, can't be a thing. No matter what you call any, can, let's say this is a reversion, whatever you talk about this, there is nothing, nothing in the physical universe that can turn upon itself and be superimposed upon itself in all parts of itself. That's impossible. Even a snake can only bite its tail. It can't swallow its mouth. Right? Have you ever heard of a snake swallowing its own mouth in a fury to just, oh, no, 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 no. Therefore, there is something in man that can turn it about 
and such so it can turn about on the whole of itself, it cannot be corporeal. It can't be a physical attribute. It must, by necessity, be something beyond the physical. And that function in reason that can turn about and turn around and look upon itself must therefore be in the realm of spirit. Ah. So that so that by the reversion upon oneself, one discovers in the exercise of reason in a totally different way. Because here is the need to understand. Understand the very things we mentioned, the cause is what maintains and dissolves. Oh, now look. What do you get when you then awaken this kind of reason to understand these things? What do you get for it? What you get is an understanding of how all of these mean terms work. You see, these are all mean terms. These are all mean terms. Because when you struggle to get out of your fate, you are then in this realm. When you're in this realm, in that activity, that activity of reason is not physical, therefore it's not bound by fate. That's a new kind of freedom. And therefore, even though we may be generated, our bodies may be generated in time, we can say the, our very nature is sometimes called substance. Our substance is eternal. No, that is to say it's not in time. It's not in time. Not in time. It doesn't age, it doesn't grow, it's there. With that moment of recognition, you can step out of the fated. This is time bound. This is bound by time, locked into time. Breaking out of time is to step out of time. So therefore, part of man's nature must necessarily, by these reasonings, to be stepping out of time. And therefore, there's a part of man's nature which must be regarded as being eternal. Part of our nature, however, has been made, generated. So therefore, we are in time, we come into time, we pass out of time, but there's an aspect of us that can reflect on the whole fated universe of which we're a part and emerge from it. We can emerge from it. When we emerge from it, we are in this middle triangle. Because now we see we have been provided with something called reason and understanding. We now have the power of reason to turn around. And by that, we are then provided with the basis for our own growth. Hey, remember what we said down here about this triangle? There are three things. Let's see, there's a certain growth potential that's involved here. There's a certain reweaving and a certain nourishment. These same three ideas now operate here in the realm of reason and this triangle. Therefore, there's a different kind of growth for man he then can remake himself, that's what he's doing by getting, getting out of this bound existence. And therefore, he finds a new way to grow and a new kind of nourishment. Ah, now, how does he do that? Well, that means, that means that he can only do that by working, continuously working on himself, but what you need is a model. You need a model. Archetype. Because one way of working is that when you're trying to emerge from the locked nature, fated nature, and you're trying to get your, your freedom to emerge from it by seeking causes and trying to find out what maintain that fated existence, as you seek the dissolution of the forces of fate, you're moving towards something. The degree, therefore, that you also are provided with models and archetypes to guide, that will sharpen what it is you want to separate yourself from. 
because a lot of it you don't even know what it is, what's part of nature or fated and what is not. So therefore, new models and archetypes come in here. Where does that come from? Once you're into the realm of the provider of reason, you see, then these two triangles become rather close, don't they? Because remember what we said, there must be a model. There must be a model for this creation. So in this way, there must be a model. We must have a model for our own creation, reworking, recreating. Now, how do you do it? What is that spiritual practice and discipline that brings that about? Because you need a model or an archetype, right? you need a practice, and you have to have a practice then that can awaken the bounds, ideally awaken this, surface this. You see, you can't deal with something that you don't see or can't recognize, so you have to find a way to surface one's own chains, right? because fate is all connected. It's chained, chained. It's being chained. Right? Chained. Sometimes this is called Prometheus. You see, when Prometheus was chained in the Caucasus on that mountain, right? That's fate. He was fated. That was his fate. Zeus gave him that fate. Hey, you stole the fire and gave mankind the arts. Well, then you will be chained and fated. There's your existence. And therefore, the whole struggle of Prometheus is to get remove the chains. Well, we therefore need to look for where to get the models and the archetypes, where to get the practices. Well, luckily enough, therefore, keeping this now, we can therefore create another one. Let's create another one. Because what we're coming to is this rather simple analogy. Providence is to fate as we can say eternity is to time. All right, is to time. We can say providence is to fate as, as freedom is to being bound, uh, chained, to use the image we had before. We can say providence is to fate as a model, a self-conscious model, a self-conscious model is to a, um, an imposed model and order. Right? This is self-revealed as the other is imposed by nature. Nature is fixed. And since it's fixed, it's an ordered system. This is a very ordered system. It shows the whole thing is rational in the sense that it's all ordered, but it's fixed and locked. Therefore, providence rules fate. Providence rules fate. It control, controls fate. It's a rational but rigid structure. Now, that means, right, if man then can, can emerge, going back to our man for a moment. All right, now we're now saying man, to, remove the chains that bind him. He has to be able to see what binds him. Right, you have to discover what it is. Right, you have to know the causes, what maintains in its dissolution. You have to discover that. Well, to sharpen that ability, if you then have a model or archetype, You can then contrast this with your condition and seek to make changes. Hey, that's this. See, you're focusing on a model. 
You're focusing on a model, and as a result of that, you're now going to create something. What you're going to create here, though, is a purification. You're going to try to get rid of the chains that bind. Well, here's the problem. It's a simple problem. Is there anything beyond purification? Is that all that's needed? Is that all that's needed? Is just a catharsis, a purification? Might there not be also a need for perfection? Because if there's a need for perfection, then there's something other than a purifying that we've been talking about that must be at work. Well, in Proclus and Plato, the idea of perfection is a very interesting idea. It's not that you have to go out and do something in addition. You have to be able to hold and maintain your highest vision. That's perfection. It's not doing something in addition, but it's trying to discover how to hold on and maintain your highest vision. That's the goal. That's the goal. Because we can always slip out of wherever we are and find the comfort of the old and the familiar, and that's the problem. Now, if this is part of nature, you see, if this is part of our universe, and not just a mere illusion, then there's something in our very nature that's struggling to try to bring about a greater degree of growth and perfection. That means there's something in the nature of the universe which is uh, good. Uh, and seeks to bring about a goodness. Well, not only that, but it looks like it, in doing that, it looks like it's able to use, see, it's able to use this model, use it as an artist would use it, to create. That means that there is a force in the very nature of our existence that, that therefore uses, this goodness uses in intellect, reason, and understanding to bring about that change. Well, look here then. See, providence in this world that we're talking about, philosophy, especially Proclus, Plato, Providence is that prior, it is what is prior to seeing, prior to intellect, see? It's something prior to intellect, it uses intellect, it's prior to intellect, that is in its own nature a basic goodness, that's providence. What is prior to intellect, that's exercising goodness to those things that can participate in it, that's the word providence. Oh. Well, what's the way? What's the way? There, basically, um, Proclus in, uh, and his work um, on providence, matter of fact, on providence, let's use that. He goes back to the Platonic model and he says the way to do it is study arithmetic, geometry, studies of the philosopher king, and um, that is to generate models. That's to generate models. That's to generate models. That's to make clear this tension. Well, let's see if we can see that by looking at what we said in the opposite way. Right? If we're chained, caught, trapped into patterns that we don't understand, then that diminishes. Right? 
that diminishes our energy, right? Diminishes our energy, diminishes our capacity for growth and development. It blocks our capacity to emerge from or into, blocks our capacity to emerge into a spiritual domain. Yeah. Therefore, it's, it, it diminishes, it blocks, it chomps, it locks. Well, then what you need to see then is what will do exactly the opposite rather than diminish our energy, blocks our growth. Let's take the other side of it then. What will increase it, right? increase our energy, bring about a greater potential for growth, uh, does, reduces blocks so that it's possible to merge into a more spiritual domain. Now, they are in, in the Platonic realm, the key role of models and archetypes. I'm going to hold back from that for a moment and go into arithmetic. Now, this is a different kind of arithmetic, of course. In Plato, the entire arithmetic means you're doing nothing other than raising and being focusing on one question. And that is, what, after all, is the nature of the one in itself? All nature is one, all connected, interconnected. That's a one, a one that's many. The provider, the providing, and the provided that's a one. This is a one. There are many ones that are unities. There are many ones that are simply collections, a sum, a sum of things, designating a sum of things. There's also a whole. Right? You want to say, I have all that I need. Right? You also then can have a number of parts coming together as a union. You can also have something emerge on a level of perfecting, right? When something is perfecting, then all of the parts are brought together on a higher level, and therefore that's functioning in that way, right? When you bring together, when you bring together and hold together everything under the impact of this, um, you then have a not necessary kind of goodness that flows through everything. When that term is used, then a new word comes in called wholeness, which we sometimes call wholesomeness. Now, all of these, all of these are different ways of talking about one. So look here, what would happen if you just decided to try this question out? Then whatever you're doing, you're going to be dealing with something in here, aren't you? Every time you're doing anything, you're involved in this. Uh, this is one. Hey, no, it's, I got one, two, I got two, both chalk, I got five fingers, I got one hand. It's all together, unity, ah, whole, no parts missing. Uh, you can have a kind of relation, a meaningful relationship with someone. That's a union where you're willing to be free and be respected within your freedom and not be taken advantage of. That's a dimension of freedom. That's allowing risk taking so that you then are involved in a perfecting and you hope that will bring about an, an a relaxation of tensions bound by fate. Well, then, good heavens, uh, that's a one, that's a one, this table one, this is a one, this is a one. Good heavens, everything is a one. And you can use this language to talk about in what way it's a one. But since the idea of one lies behind all of these, since there are different ways of talking about one,
what is the one in itself? Because we do not agree, there are different ranges of experience depending upon which one of these you, you engage in or allow yourself to be engaged in. So everything is a one. Well, then that's all you are. Hey, wait a minute, the entire universe is a one. Hmm. Uh, all nature is one. These three triangles are all one triangle, different aspects of it showing itself in three different dimensions, but basically one. Right. Then everything is nothing other than a one in these many manifold ways of being one. Well, suppose someone were to say, look, I don't want any more worrying about or dealing with the way in which the one can manifest in all these different ways. What's the one in itself? Say, excuse me, what? Say, well, look here. There are many different kinds of colors. Huh? Many different kinds of colors, red, yellow, blah, blah, blah. And there must be something that they all have in common by virtue of which you call them color. Yeah. Well, you can ask, what is color, can you? Yes. Well, then, if these are all the different ways in which you can express one, then what is that one which runs through them all? Because none of them are one in itself. That's the study of arithmetic. That's the study of arithmetic. You're with someone. Right? You're engaged in some intellectual task. Right? To the degree that you can find a common basis, you form a unity. You're no longer just two things together. Right? The two things together, even if they're holding on to one another, that's only a whole, that's okay. But is there a possible way of finding in that holy union? Is that way in which you can be perfected and find your freedom and integrity within it so that a wholeness may emerge? Higher, more complex levels of one. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Now here's the step. Here's the interesting step. That all of these, all of these, are just different ways of sharing in the one. But since all of these things bring about a wholesomeness, a perfecting, therefore it's also good and must, must show itself as a higher degree of goodness as you proceed through each one of these categories. Well, then it looks like the one and the good are the same or identical. Huh. Well, that's nice to know. But what is it in its, what is the nature of the one in itself? Okay, let's shift gears for a moment. All right. Let's go into the realm of religion. In order to be, in that sense, religious, a person might then reflect, well, after all, after all, what is the nature of God? I don't know whether you can do that. You might ask, what after all is the way in which, the way in which a person can relate to God? Oh, uh, certain kinds of beliefs, certain kinds of behavior, all right, certain kinds of behavior, certain kinds of sacrifices, uh, certain kinds of activities which are said to be significant, uh, sacraments, beneficial actions. But you see, behind all of this must be an image of some god, which then is related to in these ways. So the person who's religious, who wants to grasp the nature of the god that they believe in, is required to end up doing something, believing, having their behavior modified, enter into sacrifices, enter into relationships with their other members who share the similar beliefs. That's different than this person, isn't it? Because this person, after all, what is the nature of the one? Whatever they encounter, they're seeing nothing other than a manifestation or a shadow of the one in itself. 
Therefore, this leads to more advanced states of mind. That's what we called them a moment ago, didn't we? And therefore, this is a spiritual development or a philosophical dimension that is not in the same class as this dimension. Therefore, this is a philosophical training that then brings someone closer to this model, this basic triune model. Now, look, look here. Let's put one more thing in here. And this is an interesting aspect of Plato. Now we're going to go for the model and the archetype. Same triangle, same triangle. Model. The person who seeks to act upon it and the relationship they may get with another. We can use this as friends might, but most often among lovers. That this person then has an idea of the way in which he thinks he should be. To that degree, he wants to enter into a relationship where he can find those same qualities in the beloved. So in that way, he's going to encourage a kind of relationship and development with that person that can make that more apparent, surface it. To the degree, therefore, that he's clear about the model in his own mind, to that degree, then, he can share that model with the other so that they then are not just being, uh, as it were, fated, bound by that imposition, but to the degree that the other party can enter into that with freedom, then what they are then doing to the degree then that they focus on the model and purify that model and learn more about that model, and then exhibit that kind of re uh, way of being in themselves, then the distance between these three diminishes. It diminishes. That's what you do with a model in the Greek world. Now, that's the model in the Phaedrus. That's the model in the Symposium. Different kind of model, by the way, because the model in the Symposium is the teacher as diatima. This model, or the archetype and the Phaedrus, are the different gods. Each of the gods has a distinct state of mind, way of being, and therefore these people who engage in this kind of matching, as it were, then must be clear. The clearer they are about the particular model, they may go for Zeus, Apollo, etc. To that very degree, then, they are becoming like that model. They're becoming like that model. They're becoming, oh, there, look, 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 this is what you got. They are becoming like, both of them now, are being a demiurgos in fashioning themselves, in fashioning themselves to that model, and then making the relationship they have mirror that. So both are doing it. Both are doing it together, and therefore, to that degree, they're bringing that into existence, right? Into their, into their way of being. Therefore, this is bringing the divine into manifestation. All under the aspect of they think it's for their ultimate good. Hey, providence. Reflecting upon oneself. So that's the archetypal model in a few words. There's much more to be said about it. But I want to go now to the other part of this. Proclus also mentions geometry. Now there's a kinship between geometry and astronomy. Now, 
just as we are understanding arithmetic in this very high sense, purely speculative sense, same thing is going to be true for these two things. To the degree that one is doing that, one is then turning upon, remember what we said, that we see alike turning upon oneself. And therefore, this very process turns the soul around to real being. Now, that real being is this model in the mind of God. That's sometimes called the forms. That's sometimes called the idea of the good. Well, this activity, therefore, turns one around towards real being, which then it must be contemplated. Now, what does that mean? You see, these two people we were talking about, they can then reflect on their daily lives. They can reflect upon their model. They can engage in ways in which they can compare what they're doing. They're actively participating in this kind of growth. Remember what we called it? Growth, nourishment, reweaving. They're reweaving, refashioning themselves in this process. That's a contemplation. That's a contemplation to contemplate, right? to consider, to reflect on, to do. And finally, to merge with the model itself, real being. The problems one engages and the one encounters, the problems one engages in, the problem one encounters in doing this, that's what he calls astronomy. <laughs> which then have to be unpacked, understood, resolved. That's what he calls astronomy in the Republic. Different than we call it. Matter of fact, he says, our astronomy goes real contrary to the way in which astronomy is discussed by among the, the adepts who then look to the heavens. He says, we don't look to the heavens. Says, That's what they do. We don't do that. We want to see, we want to study it in the same way that geometry is studied because we're interested in the problems encountered in that realm. So therefore, the problems that are discovered in this process are called astronomy. The problems that are surfaced is called the contemplation of, of this activity. It's called geometry. And that's nothing other than, than doing this one after all is the one. Because would you not agree, as this process goes on, what's the final end? Oneness. Therefore, they're becoming one. Therefore, if they're becoming one, they may catch a glimpse in this rather quite interesting and fantastic problem, which is what, after all, is the nature of the one in itself. Huh? Rather interesting, isn't it? Now, I got a quote I wanted to read you. on providence and faith. He talks about trying to get away from the fated existence. It's the tumult, the tumult, the, the uh, being caught up in that fated condition. He says, when you separate yourself from that, see, when all of those inferior powers are settled, when they're now at rest, he says, when all of those things are at rest, he, thank you, thank you, thank you. When all those powers are at rest and they no longer exist with any confusing, fogging, power, not engage in the many things they're accustomed to being. Then he says, energy is converted to herself. Remember, energy is always here, the mean. Energy then is converted to herself. It's not dissipated in this 
fated bound manner. Energy is, is now converted to herself. Soul now can see her own essence, turning about, Lucia, and the powers she contains. and the harmonic ratios which she cons consists of. And the many lives of which she is the completion. See, many lives she's the completion because you're going to the archetype. Rediscovers herself to be rational in a rational world. The image, indeed, of the nature is prior to herself from which she departed now enters the paradigm, the archetype, you see, which is prior to her and over which she presides. To the energy of the soul, to get that going, see, the energy by which this is affected, to this energy of the soul, my friend, Arithmetic and geometry, the mother of your art, are said to contribute much. And he says, because it purifies the intellect from the rational forms of life with which it is surrounded, fated, and led to the incorporeal comprehension of forms, Finally, he says, led to the lustrations of the future mystics and to the most sacred of mysteries. So if these energies of the rational soul then are manifested let us then survey, survey her now running back to the highest intelligence through which she sees her sister souls in the world which are allotted the heavens and the whole of generation according to the will of the Father. And she being a part desires the contemplation of them. She, that's the soul always, sees the intellectual essences and the orders of what are. So therefore, the soul is bled upward by intellectual surveys to truly mystical intuitions of the supermundane gods. What's she doing? You see, he's got the same model and he's saying as this goes on, as these archetypes become the very gods in the Greek world, Zeus, Apollo, and things like that, you become one to it. That's the model. Well, that's this. You're returning to the model of whatever it is. Therefore, at that moment, you are gaining a direct insight into the fullness of that model. And since that model is the very thing that molded and shaped you willingly with your own freedom to go into this. It brought about your own goodness by following something that was good. Oh, providence. So this is a spiritual system, a philosophical system, highly condensed for the evening which has a spiritual basis, since it's a, involved a kind of practice where one's whole life becomes the arena through which you practice and in which you practice and develop and cultivate reason and understanding of what's chaining you, where you focus on the pattern. See, this is a pattern and the model is a pattern, only this is a pattern where you're locked in by nature, by your own interior forces. This is one that's lofty with which you can emerge. So therefore, it's a spiritual or philosophical practice that's providential, that therefore is the basis for a spiritual way of existing without being holy. 
Wait a minute, what? Yeah, you don't have to be holy. Hey, it requires a different kind of sacrifice, not the same kind of sacrifice. The behavior will be changed, but not because of some acceptance of certain vows or commandments. There's no belief involved in it. There's no binding belief that's going to save you. This has nothing to do with belief. Because this is a way of seeing whether your beliefs can be confirmed in your own experience. Therefore, it is a spiritual system that has the same goals, highest goals, but it's not a religion. Therefore, it's a religion of no religion based upon the idea of providence, which is what I wanted to talk about tonight. Thank you. Hmm. Is that, um, is that uh, personal for each person? Each person's providence is his own unique? Because each person is, is the result of all of the particular forces, the particular forces that lock them, though they, this, the same forces, the same set of beliefs may bind you, but in each person it's going to be a unique set of them. Mm -hmm. So there's no general solution. If there's no general solution, then there's no basic belief. That will save you. Right. See, in this game, the, in the realm of belief, this is really the realm of belief, mm -hmm. being trapped into this invariably must spring from particular beliefs imposed at a particular time under very strict and, and particular conditions. Therefore, there's never any general solution to the problem of one's fate. There isn't any general solution. One have to find the particular causes. Right? Therefore, you have to go into the particular, you have to see it most particularly or you can't get on because that's what the imposition of belief is. A particular imposition of a particular set of beliefs under certain circumstances that are maintained over a length of time that control. So that's your faith. One you space, that's one's faith. So you have to know that. Yeah. Well. yeah. And then providence, and then you employ your providence? or Well, see, remember, providence is a word that's difficult to use because we don't use it very often. But what it is central, what the word providence just means is that there is built into, built into the universe, our universe, mm -hmm. a basic goodness mm -hmm. that allows this growth and transformation. And since it uses intellect and reason and understanding, since whatever is used, right? must necessarily have a less of a status than what's using it. So here, therefore, since it shows a goodness, what must be prior to a goodness is the good. And therefore, built into the nature of what is our reality is a goodness which uses the intellect, reason, and understanding for those who want to take the challenge. That's providence prior to intellect. That's what the word means. Some goodness prior to intellect. What's providence? Some goodness prior to intellect that directs and uses intellect to bring about a goodness. Therefore, it presupposes there must be, in the nature of reality, the good. Curious system, isn't it? Oh, curious? Yeah. Yes. Who or how did it get built in? 
Who or how did it get built in? Who or how did it get built in? You mean the good one? The good. What? The good. How did it get built in? Uh, can you equally use the word the one as well as the good? Yes. Did I answer that? I presume was a little bit of no. <laughs> See, in this in this whole way of considering things, remember all the terms we had here, all different ways of using the idea of one. You would have a similar set over here for good, wholesomeness, whole, perfecting, union, right? That as you proceed with the set of terms about the good, you would find an overlapping of terms, and therefore you could then show how those overlapping terms can be interrelated, and that will be then a definition of why the, the one and the good are the same or identical, which is what Proclus does in the 13th proposition. Now, let me, uh, let me see if I can deal with your question. Um, it is, see, to say how it is there means there must be something that puts it there that is responsible for its existence. And that would mean there is something prior to it that generates it to serve a, punct a function. Um, If you hold to that notion, right, then would you then say whatever it is that put it there must have had in some sense an idea it was going to do something for something? Yes. Well, whatever is going to do something to bring about a good must itself be good, must it not? Yes. Well, good heavens, then we're still back with the question of, after all, what is the one in itself, or after all, what is the good in itself. What is the nature of the good in itself? So it's by this reasoning that you come up with that this is the ultimate term from which all other terms are derived. Or to put it another way, see, remember the terms we had here when we were exploring the idea of the one. If each of these are different altered states of mind experiences, then uh, as you proceed up through them, as it were, the others are not in conflict, but are subsumed within it until you're getting more and more profound glimpses of what the one is in itself. Well, so in the end, all there is is one. And since nothing else, you don't even use the word one. And that was probably a quick trip through the Parmenides. So let me ask you, what is it like going through this? Um, Mind-boggling? Mind-boggling. <laughs> What's that? Mind-boggling? <laughs> To boggle. <laughs> to boggle the mind. And here we are trying to unboggle the mind, and yeah. we're turning around and boggling up the mind. <laughs> well, this is a way of talking that uh, not very many people get involved in. It's an um, old way. It's an interesting one. Um, I enjoy it. Well, it's nice that it's got the two parts, the, both the purification and the perfection. Usually, mm -hmm. there's one or the other, not both. Oh, yeah, it has to be, you have to have both. See, then there has to be a vitalizing, because to do that, see, to the degree to which you get out of that, then more and more energy is available to you, naturally. Mm -hmm. And that vitalizing is a result of turning the mind around on itself, Right? So you have a perfecting, a purifying, right? you have a vitalizing, you have a turning the mind around upon itself. All of these are actions of something that's all going towards the good. Does the creator need the created to exist? <laughs> 
um, that takes this argument um, it's a curious argument I can give it to you in this way take three things right? if a thing is not itself complete right? but must generate then in generating when it's not complete the result is inferior and since it's engaged in an activity which should have been towards its own development and its own perfection as it goes towards something other than itself it is diminished by that activity ah, if it were totally full and if it were to generate and create well then to that degree that activity itself would diminish part of its fullness it would be a drain but it certainly wouldn't be like something incomplete that started with it it wouldn't mean that the production is inferior its production could be in fact as close to perfection as possible but it would have been diminished by the act of creation wait a minute is there a possibility that therefore any kind of creative process is a fountain an overflowing a natural overflowing if it's naturally overflowing, then it's not two or three. And therefore, if it is full, if it is full, complete, and an overflowing of abundance, then it's only natural it's going to create. So put it in another way, all right? To the degree then that you can take a look at what it is that's generated, to the degree that, see, to the degree that you can finally see the inferior nature of, your, of the creation, whether you're talking about a sculpting or a relationship or whatever it is one is making, and one can then take a look at the creator of it and see that they were diminished by the very act of creating it, you know that they must have sacrificed for that creation themselves. Hmm. Here. Here, if they are full, right, complete, full, then by the very act of creating, they had to be diminished by it, and that too was a kind of sacrifice. Now, what would happen to anything over here that had the power then to turn around and seek its own source? It would discover, would it not, that its own creation was done by a sacrifice of the creator. And therefore, that would mean, therefore, the person then must recognize that that role that existence they have was borrowed by the creator at being diminished ah over here the person that returns to the source what is it they would more likely encounter an overwhelming flow no, no depreciation continuous creation continuous creativity Therefore, the universe in this model of the demiurgos, it's not a one-shot creation. But so long as the demiurgos is focusing on the model, that is what sustains it and continues it, and it's a continuous overflowing. Now, in this game, there is, you can also talk about uh, an order of the divine above this that isn't engaged in this that doesn't as it were see this is an activity of seeing itself and in that seeing itself there's a natural consequence therefore there's an order of divine where the seeing itself doesn't follow this doesn't follow therefore there's an order of gods or an order of divine that doesn't go through that creative process and so on. There are four orders of gods. And, and, uh, well, okay. There's a maker. There's a God, the maker, right? Or they, as he calls it, there's a father, there's a maker, there's a godfather, and there's a father maker. But 
So there's a maker. It's, a, it's an analogy, four terminology. There's a maker, there's a father. There's a father maker, and there's a maker father. What we often deal with is the maker father, demiurgos. So we ought to do that one evening. Mm -hmm. All right, you can then see their four orders. All right? Thank you.